Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Friday, August 14th, 2015, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here is a look at what's coming up tonight. Tonight, Hillary finally hands over her professionally wiped server as believing that she has nothing to hide has become even more difficult to swallow. I'm running for president. Everyday Americans need a champion, and I want to be that champion. I'm hitting the road to earn your vote, and I hope you'll join me on this journey. Then, the role technology will play in our very near future. And the surveillance state kicks into high gear. That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm running for president. Everyday Americans need a champion, and I want to be that champion. I'm hitting the road to earn your vote, and I hope you'll join me on this journey. That's exactly how I feel at the thought of Hillary Clinton for president. Now, we've already told you that she finally turned over her server after all this time, but now we know that she handed it over after it was professionally wiped clean. So this means it was wiped clean of any usable information, and the three thumb drives that she also turned over, they contained only what she selectively culled from her server. So again, just total transparency here with this one. Uh, this is a myriad of criminal offenses that are applied to this conduct. And the observer points out the colossal number of Clinton crimes here that are just piling up and how the federal law enforcement is blatantly uh, just turning a blind eye to this, anyone else would have already been thrown in jail. Um, so these are infractions of laws that are designed to protect national security. And we've seen in the past uh, that they've gone after people, even reporters. Um, they've been investigated, prosecuted. Some of them have spent years in prison. So they go on to point out how um, the federal law enforcement didn't hesitate one minute to investigate um, and prosecute former CIA director General David Petraeus, he shared his notebook with his biographer slash girlfriend. I mean, he didn't turn over any top secret information there, uh, but of course his name was dragged through the mud. They've also threatened news reporters and prosecuted whistleblowers um, under the Espionage Act. In fact, this administration has uh, prosecuted more reporters and whistleblowers for espionage than all prior administrations put together. Of course, they immediately seized Fox News reporter James Rosen's emails without him even knowing. Same thing was happening to Cheryl Atkinson. She reported that her computer was being taken over, of course. Um, and then, of course, we've reported about uh, former House Speaker Dennis Hastert and Senator Menendez. So they were getting all, you know, all kinds of bad press. Senator Menendez can't even go on vacation with his best friend because that looks a little fishy. Meanwhile, Hillary Clinton and her foundation can accept millions of dollars from foreign governments that are, of course, seeking to curry her favor there at the State Department. And the Wall Street Journal uh, points out that the entire time of her State Department tenure, Hillary Clinton declined to allow an inspector general there. So uh, there was no internal oversight. And of course, <laughs> let's not forget that $6 billion that vanished under Hillary Clinton's State Department. So are we seeing a pattern here? Anyone else, anyone else would have already been arrested, thrown in jail. But no, she's still being paraded around like she's the Democratic frontrunner, like she's the inevitable future president. She is a criminal. But you know what? Hillary Clinton is not alone in her criminal politicking. Take a look. If nothing's going to change, I don't know how we ever expect to win. John Boehner, the whimpering poster boy for the left-right paradigm and its inner corporate mechanizations. The man that oversees the shameful backdoor deals rampant in the nation's capital that have spiraled out of control and spilled out into the main streets of America. Needs to be fired. He's nothing but a low-down, double-dealing, backstabbing, larcenous, perverted world. Hanging's too good for him. Burning's too good for him. Representative Mark Meadows, a Republican from District 11 in North Carolina, introduced House Resolution 385 on July 28th. 
The resolution requires 29 Republican members of the House to vote to vacate the chair. The Republican Speaker of the House, John Boehner, would then need to beg Democrats to save his treasonous skin. This action has never succeeded in the House and has only been attempted once, 105 years ago. So why should we fire John Boehner? Well, the Mark Meadows resolution lists a number of grievances. A few of those include, Boehner caused the power of Congress to atrophy, thereby making Congress subservient to the executive and judicial branches. Boehner is using the power of the office to punish members who vote according to their conscience instead of the will of the Speaker. John Boehner used his political ally, Oversight Chairman Jason Chavitz, to punish Meadows by releasing him of his subcommittee chairmanship for voting against the procedural motion to fast-track the TPP. But Chavitz and Boehner couldn't bully Meadows out of his chair after conservatives rallied strong disapproval. Boehner is making it abundantly clear. Speak the will of the American people and you will be punished. Other grievances include providing for voice votes on consequential and controversial legislation to be taken without notice and with few members present. Another grievance reads, John Boehner does not comply with the spirit of the rules, which provide that members shall have three days to review legislation before voting. The American people can't even see what's in the TPP. Uh, in the House, the American people's priorities continue to be our priorities. Free trade is good for jobs. Uh, it's good for America's farmers, manufacturers, and small businesses. Uh, trade votes are never a, an easy lift around here, but Republicans uh, are continuing to work, uh, and we're seeing some positive uh, momentum in the right direction. And remember when Nancy Pelosi said this. But we have to pass the bill so that you can uh, find out what is in it. Any of your listeners, whatever state they might be in, if they would call their member of Congress, all of them are home now for the next three, four weeks, actually, and call them and ask them, tell the person that answers the phone to remind that congressman that he or she could join in this resolution to vacate the chair. And if we can get enough votes, what will happen, we will have a straight up and down vote on who the next speaker, speaker should be to replace John Bain. The H, -Con Res H Resolution 385 is now in the Rules Committee. The Rules Committee will be the committee that will determine to send this back to the full House, meaning back to the floor of the House, for a vote. Every member sitting on the floor of the House will have a chance to vote uh, to vacate the chair, and then that would mean there would be another vote for the Speaker of the House, uh, and it would be a new person if that happened. So that's where it is. Combat that lingering feeling of defeat we Americans have endured daily for years. Make your voice heard. Call, email, or personally ask your representative to vacate the chair. This is your country. It doesn't belong to blubbering traitorous scum like John Boehner. Fire John Boehner. Resist the tyranny. This is how our founders set up the system for peaceful revolution. John Bound for Infowars.com. The very good news is that we see that this river is restoring itself, that we see those numbers shifting. So that was the country's top environmental official saying that just one week after toxic sludge was dumped into a river, turning it a hideous shade of orange, saying that this, the river is now restoring itself just one week later. So of course, nature has a way of restoring itself when the EPA is to blame, isn't that funny? In any other case, can you imagine if it was a private company that had done something like this, accidentally destroyed an entire ecosystem? Um, you'll recall the EPA said that the BP oil spill in the Gulf would take decades um, for, for it to be not affecting the fishing. And then they levied heavy sanctions against BP. I think there were billions of dollars in fines. They were barred for years from federal contracts. But, you know, the... the the EPA, they're okay. You know, they're they're being held accountable for this. This is also the same agency that said cow farts. Cow farts are going to destroy humanity because of global cooling. I mean, global warming, or I'm sorry, climate change. Cow farts, right? But now they're saying an estimated 3 million gallons of toxic sludge contaminated with heavy metals, including lead and arsenic, dumped into this water accidentally. Oh, everything is going to be fine. So fine, in fact, that the governor there in Colorado, Governor Hickenlooper, took a bold swig right out of the river water. So, of course, here, just trying to let everyone know it's completely safe. 
New Mexico has not <laughs> deemed it safe for drinking, but that guy's an animal. But let's go back to this article. So they say that there are still concerns about the river basin sediment, which th basically these absorbed contaminants from the spill could be released back into the river during stormy weather in the future. So that's obviously a cause for concern, and it's already stirring up some conspiracy theories uh, because a week before the EPA disaster disastrously leaked these millions of gallons of waste into the Animas River, uh, there was a letter to the editor published in the Silverton Standard and Miner. It's a local newspaper there, and it was authored by a retired geologist, and he detailed verbatim how the EPA would foul the Animas River on purpose in order to secure Superfund money. So this is a geologist, Dave Taylor, and he predicted that the EPA's plugging plan uh, would ultimately fail, and then the agency would likely use the failure to seek super funding. He wrote, the grand experiment, in my opinion, will fail, and guess what? The EPA representative will say then, gee, plan A didn't work, so I guess we'll have to build a treatment plant at a cost to taxpayers of 100 to $500 million. And he talks about how a disturbance, i.e. stormy weather, will cause the contamination to increase. Um, he also says if the gold, the nearby Gold King mine was declared a Superfund site, it would not only mean buku bucks for the EPA, but it would essentially kill any future developments for the mining industry in the area. So here he is predicting verbatim what was going to happen. A week later, it goes on to happen. And uh, so I don't know. I guess we'll just have to wait and see if it gets turned into a super fun site. I just think it's really funny how they give nature some credit when, you know, it's a federal agency that's to blame. And now we've got a story coming out of Finland. It's a novel New World Order idea. Uh, in order to stop welfare recipients from joining ISIS, a member of the nationalist-oriented Finns party has suge suggested implanting tracking chips in all of Finland's welfare recipients. He says the law should be changed. To receive payments, one has to tell exact data about your location using your personal code read by a satellite. It is also possible to implant electronic chips to all going abroad who, for example, receive medical welfare from Kela, which is their uh, welfare agency there. Now, he says that this idea does not violate privacy because with Google or Facebook, it is already clear where we are. So he thinks that because Google and Facebook and everyone else wants to track us without our permission, that we could just these implantable chips are totally fine. So obviously, this is an elitist, classist idea rich kids aren't going to go join ISIS. It's only welfare recipients. That doesn't even make sense. So this is just another opportunity for them to control people. And of course, that is why the government wants to get you attached to the state. That's why they want you to need that government, the government goodies, because then they can control you, can control your movements, control you vaccinating your children. You'll recall that that's what Australia did. They were going to cut $11,000 worth of benefits to parents who don't vaccinate their children. So, you know, but you don't even need implantable chips. Now companies are actually using wearable technology to track the behavior of their employees. So they really, I mean, they just think they own us here. Of course, in the past, companies looking to increase the productivity of their staff would dole out Christmas bonuses and things like that. Now, human optimization is the rage. That's what they're... We're, we're, we're being optimized. So this wearable technology has led to the creation of the devices that are capable of building up a, a personalized biological profile of employees, and it allows the employers to analyze when they are at their peak and when they're having an off day. See, so we are just cogs in the machine. And do you ever feel that, you know, it's kind of pointless sometimes? Well, new poll results are showing that 37% of British workers think their jobs are totally meaningless. So this is truly sad considering how much time most people actually spend working throughout their lives. And uh, so what does this say about overall fulfillment? I mean, it's pretty sad. Doesn't seem promising. Well, in an article by David Graeber, he talks about the phenomenon of BS jobs and where this sort of started. He argues that in 1930, Economist John Maynard Keynes predicted that by the end of the century, technology would have advanced sufficiently that in countries such as the UK and the US, we would be on 15-hour work weeks. But in technological terms, 
we're quite capable of this, and yet it hasn't happened. So instead, technology has been marshaled to figure out ways to make us all work more. Huge swaths of people in Europe and North America in particular spend their entire working lives performing tasks they believe to be unnecessary. The moral and spiritual damage that comes from this situation is profound. It is a scar across our collective soul, yet virtually no one talks about it. And he goes on to theorize that in the late 60s and early 70s, there was mounting fear about a society full of hippie proles with too much time on their hands. They saw what happened during the hippie revolution there, and they were like, we cannot have this. And so the ruling class sort of freaked out about robots taking everyone's jobs, and then what were they going to do with all of us? Um, so instead of technology making all of our lives easier, there was a shift, and it was actually medicine that became advanced, and it was medication like Ritalin, Zoloft, and Prozac, all of which are tailor-made to placate us and so that these professional demands that are now being put on us don't drive us completely dysfunctionally crazy. So rather than searching for alternative you know, futures based on technological advances, uh, what really has happened is that they've um, focused on labor discipline and social control, hence the internet, because it's so ubiquitous, you don't even realize that you're being controlled. Now coming up, you're gonna see the full in-depth 20 minute occulted technology report. This one includes uh, interviews that we've done with people who are professional in this area, they're explaining everything, goes so far back decades, the elite have been working to build the society of technological control rather than advancing the human race. Most news stories of late are extremely difficult to believe. Global wars, economic uncertainty, a police state rising. And in the midst of all of this, are the persistent headlines of emerging and sometimes bizarre technologies. Fully automated robots in the workforce. Incredible advances in the understanding of health and immunity. Life extension technologies. Brain implantable microchips with unimaginable applications. We're going to be able to send nanobots, blood cell size devices inside our bloodstream. They'll keep us healthy from inside and they'll go inside our brains. And if that sounds very futuristic, there are already people that have computers in their brains. What will humanity look like in the next 10 or 20 years? A human with the perfect immune system and enhanced health functions? An infinitely smarter person with their brains and minds always attached to the internet? Or how about a person with the power to control their environment just by using their thoughts? It's almost impossible to say. The technological possibilities are infinite. Is this technology just being randomly developed by thousands of talented scientists and engineers without any real plan for the future paradigm that it's going to create? Or has there been a group envisioning this future all along? If you study uh, the 16th, 17th, and 18th century manifestos and books about uh, the Rosicrucians, as I did in, in, in the libraries and archives, you see that there's mention of all kinds of technological devices. I describe such a chamber in my book, the wonders that one saw when he entered the room of an alchemist who recently had died and the alchemist had bequeathed the will to the person and the person enters the room and what he describes. Well, it, it reads like 21st century uh, technology. It may not surprise many viewers that there is a plan which has been discussed for decades amongst the top European and American social elite who spend their time gathering in closed door clubs dedicated to the occult. Now, wait a minute, what, what is the occult anyway? Uh, the word occult comes from, uh, simply means something that's hidden. Uh, and uh, they used that uh, back during the uh, Middle Ages um, when somebody was going against the uh, conventional church doctrine, then they'd say, well, they're occultists, they're looking into the occult. And, and this range is, is a pretty good wide range in occultism anyway, all the way from tree worship or nature worship, uh, all the way to worship of the devil, worship of some, you know, anthropological, you know, being somewhere. Sometimes throughout history, 
whether because of strategy or because of moral obligation, world leaders will open the curtains ever so slightly, giving the general public an opportunity to glimpse into the secret world of the elite. In the year 1856, an industrial revolution was threatening to overthrow the traditional agrarian forces in Italy. In England, Parliament was debating over whether England should intervene in the Italian crisis, when during this debate, Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli warned, there is in Italy a power which we seldom mention in this house, but without considering and understanding which we shall never rightly comprehend the position of Italy. I mean the secret societies. The secret societies do not care for constitutional government. They do not want existing society ameliorated. They want it changed. He goes on to say, it is useless to deny because it is impossible to conceal that a great part of Europe, the whole of Italy and France, and a great portion of Germany, to say nothing of other countries, are covered with a network of these secret societies. Disraeli gave this warning to prevent England from miscalculating the outcome of their intervention. There was a, a war in Italy going on, and Italy was infested with secret societies of all kinds and all shapes. But not only, not only Italy, in fact, the whole of Europe was infested and was out of balance because of all the secret societies that were running around, plotting, scheming. It was a terrible time of upheaval if you look closely upon the situation of the 19th century. According to Disraeli, the secret occult groups are a genuine power in Europe who can and will influence the outcome of England's actions in their favor. While this speech was given over 150 years ago, not much has changed in the secret lives of the global elite. Every July, the world's top politicians, bankers, corporate financiers, academics, and other elite members gather in Northern California for the annual Bohemian Grove Retreat. This two-week all-male get-together kicks off with their traditional cremation of care ceremony, where they burn the body of care in effigy in front of the mysterious great owl and eternal flame. Technologies such as the Star Wars Missile Defense Shield and the Manhattan Project were first discussed at the Bohemian Grove. The mysterious Georgia Guidestones stand as a monument to modern occultism. Sometimes called the American Stonehenge, it is unknown who commissioned this structure or why. What we do know is what the monument calls for, a world government with a world court, and the requirement that the human population never exceed 500 million. Presently, that means a reduction of about six and a half billion people. Interestingly, these calls are similar to the recent papal encyclical, in which Pope Francis calls for a global political authority to tackle global warming. What's even more alarming is who will be on the stage with the Pope when this encyclical is formally released. John Schellenhuber is a German professor that has some very radical views on climate change, including the belief that our planet is overpopulated by at least six billion people. Clinton White House insider Larry Nichols shared his eyewitness account of Hillary Clinton's witchcraft retreats. I was there, folks. You understand there's a difference in somebody that saw it or read it somewhere. I was there. Hillary would go on the weekend. About every fourth, fifth weekend, she would disappear out to California. Finally, she came back and said, Hillary, what on earth is happening in California? She was running with her actress buddies, Linda Bloodworth Thompson and that crew. And uh, she never told me. Finally, Bill told me that she went, she goes out there to some kind of witch's church. And I said, you've got to be kidding me, Bill. No, no. He said, oh, no, man, she does there are countless other modern instances where the secret occult beliefs of the global social elite are revealed. Just as Disraeli warned his parliament that they can't estimate an accurate outcome without factoring in the agenda of the secret societies, the same is true today. If we do not consider the agendas of these modern and powerfully connected occult organizations, then we will never understand the true motivation behind much of the political and corporate decisions 
being made today. It's really interesting and somewhat scary when you consider that behind uh, some of the push for what has now come to be called the New World Order, or I guess you'd call it a, a global socialist system, um, is the idea that there is this occultism there. Uh, you get to the very top of the power pyramid and you find people who will go to occult ceremonies, wear robes. The Stanley Kubrick film, Eyes Wide Shut, was not totally fiction. The old old hair and all the winds make merry with thy dust. Hail, fellowships, eternal flame. Once again, this summer sets us free. So what does all of this have to do with technology? Author and historian Theo Paymans reveals in his book, Free Energy Pioneer, John Worrell Keeley, that occult societies are just as obsessed with avant-garde technology as they are with exotic rituals. 19th century, extremely wealthy people were definitely not only interested in, you know, just gathering into some kind of hall and pulling down a pentagram and, and mumbling some, some evocations toward this or that deity. Occult groups routinely experimented with perpetual motion machines and zero-point energy motors. Oftentimes, when these occultists had these ideas and, and these avant-garde scientists, and they married those ideas into what I call occult technology, they created incredible machines and devices or prototypes of machines and devices, but they often would not work, or they worked in, uh, in, in, in incomprehensible ways or in ways that, you know, you couldn't predict. Rudolf Steiner said that certain mysterious societies have knowledge and understanding of occult avant-garde technological advances and energy sources, and that these affairs are being guarded as a secret in those circles on the subject of material occultism. But they will, when that which I call mechanical occultism will be put in practice, which is an ideal of these secret circles, they will achieve about 1,000 million in human labor. Rudolf Steiner was the founder of the anthroposophical movement, but he came from the theosophical uh, society. And Rudolf Steiner once commented about um, secrets that were guarded in the inner circles of certain um, secret societies and secrets not involving secrets of age-old occultism, like summoning demons from uh, ancient grimoires, but secrets having to do with a strange kind of technology. He was discussing devices, machines, or apparatuses, the like the world had never seen. You could compare it a bit with, say, the, the machinated robot factories of today, uh, and we see now that there's a huge unemployment um, amidst people, the, the, the craftsmen, the laborers who, who build these things, because now robots are doing it. With all the problems going on in the world today, uh, I don't think uh, the general population is prepared for what we're going to be facing in the very near future, and that is the problem of robotics. Right now, robotics is, is already causing problems by taking jobs from working people, but it's even getting stranger than that. With implants and with conditioning, with chemical therapy, they're beginning not only to mess with people in a physical way, but then mess with us mentally, psychologically, intellectually. Uh, and this is going to become an ever-growing problem in the future. Mechanical occultism will not only make nine-tenths of the labor superfluous, it will also make it possible to paralyze every rebellion of the unsatisfied masses. Of this, those secret societies are well aware. On this they count, when they will attain the dominance over the entire population of the Earth. Are we actually starting to see Steiner's vision take form? An automated robotic workforce, from manual labor to executive office jobs, are now being installed throughout the world, which does threaten to render human labor superfluous. Those large arm assembly line robots we're used to seeing doing the work in car manufacturing plants are yesterday's technology. Today's robotic workforce is much smaller, much cheaper, and capable of doing a variety of jobs, including executive and creative jobs. Compared to the cost of an average annual salary for just about any employee, 
including minimum wage workers, the robotic workers' one-time cost and near perfection in their job execution is a very appealing option, especially now since many cities are nearly doubling their minimum wage rate and robots don't go on strike. Is this exactly the same as what Rural Steinem meant? He envisioned machines. These machines could be steered by the thought, by the willpower, by the force of the will. So what we would be having is something that goes beyond, say, the robotic uh, workers that we see now in the factories, because in fact they are just mechanical devices uh, following a prescriptive program. But what Rudolf Steiner in fact talked about was the next stage, so the stage what we will be seeing after this robotic workforce, and that is some, some kind of golem, golemic creature, some kind of artificial creature, artificially imbibed with some kind of shadow intelligence some kind of dumb slave, yet with a, a flicker, a glimmer of intelligence, so that it can do slightly more than, say, uh, just bolting in a rivet and doing that a thousand times a day. Think, for instance, the weird robots that you saw in the Terminator series, stuff like that. With some of these new techniques where they can alter our thinking, alter our emotions, in certain instances, uh, someone who has a, a severe indefinite mental problem. This could be a wonderful solution to bring them back to a more normal lifestyle. But the big question is, what about the misuse of this by reprogramming people and programming them into being little automatons? And that leads, of course, to the question is, who is going to decide the application of this technology? Anyone who is following the technology trends knows that the reality of a fully automated labor force is right around the corner. History is filled with inaccurate predictions about machines replacing the human workforce to bring about an apocalyptic-like scenario for humanity. Some might say that we are sounding the same alarms that other doom and gloomers have in the past. At a recent artificial intelligence conference here in Austin, we ran into Max Tegmark, the co-founder of Future of Life Institute. We asked him to explain some of the emerging problems as he sees it. It used to be, you know, 300 years ago that machines during the Industrial Revolution re replaced blue-collar work, very easy to do jobs, and then those people got educated and got better paying jobs. Uh, today, Instead, our machines are playing, replacing not the muscle work, but the brain work, right? And when you lose that kind of job, the only place you can go in the economy is usually downward in, in, in pay scale. So there, there are really interesting questions. Official unemployment projections for the next 10 years predict lower unemployment numbers and a surge in the economy. Of course, none of these statistics bothered to factor in automation. It's a difficult problem, and I, I was at a meeting where there were five Nobel Prize winning economists um, and all they wanted to talk about was this question. Uh, what's the future of employment and the structure of the economy when most uh, of what we call work now is being done by robots? Um, and unfortunately, even though that was what they really cared about, they had no suggestions. Another talking point that attempts to quell the fears of an upcoming economic and social robot apocalypse reminds us that in any economy, there must be consumers with money to purchase the items the industry is manufacturing. Here is an example of applying 19th and 20th century economics to a 21st century problem. We're in new territory. Sales profits can be razor thin because the cost of labor will be automated away. The current model of economics will be different in the near future, so the model regarding supply and demand might not apply as it has in the last few centuries. In July 2013, former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers addressed a crowd at the National Bureau of Economic Research Summer Institute. He said, until a few years ago, I didn't think this was a very complicated subject. The Luddites were wrong, and the believers in technology and technological progress were right. I'm not so completely certain now. Computers and robots are designed not simply to extend human work capacity, but to eliminate the need for humans altogether. 
Justice Steiner warned that the same machines that will replace the workforce can also be used to paralyze every rebellion of the unsatisfied masses. We're also witnessing the militarization of our police. Combine this grid with fully autonomous militarized robotics and Steiner's startling prediction of a technology that will replace our workforce and paralyze humanity suddenly becomes urgent. Humanity is on the brink of a crisis and now may be our last chance to solve this mortal problem. In part two, we'll focus on the centuries old plan to combine man with machine, gain superhuman abilities and live forever. It's a vision which is rapidly becoming reality within the transhumanist movement. Unfortunately, you've grown up hearing voices that incessantly warn of government as nothing more than some separate sinister entity that's at the root of all our problems. It's time to stop submitting to this tyranny. It's time to realize that we're being enslaved. Some of these same vo voices also do their best to gum up the works. They'll warn that tyranny is always lurking just around the corner. Tyranny with a capital T. You should reject these voices. Everything that's been done with torture, rendition, the NDAA, the Patriot Acts 1 and 2, from day one, was focused on the American people, period. That's it. It's always been about erasing the Bill of Rights and Constitution and rolling out NSA spying publicly, saying it's for Al Qaeda, rolling out torture, saying it's for Al Qaeda, but it's really for the general public, rolling out total control and the end of any underground free market systems in the name of fighting Al Qaeda, but really shutting down any type of free commerce. This is all about converting us from a free society to a tyranny with a capital T. China rocked the world's financial markets this week by devaluing its currency for three days in a row, the biggest devaluation they've had in two decades. But 41 years ago, Nixon announced executive orders that rocked the world with not only currency devaluation, but created a new currency world order. In August 1971, Nixon announced a series of policies created by executive order and remembered by historians as the Nixon shock. It's still felt by average Americans, along with the repercussions of Nixon and Kissinger secretly laying the groundwork in China a month earlier that would decimate American manufacturing and leave us a debtor to China. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold. Nixon enacted wage and price controls, he imposed a 10% import tax, and he devalued U.S. currency by breaking the Bretton Woods Agreement that had tied 44 nations' currency to a U.S. dollar that was redeemable in gold. Or when the president does it, that means that it is not illegal. Nixon portrayed the move as protecting Americans from speculators. In recent weeks, the speculators have been waging an all-out war on the American dollar. Nixon lied. It wasn't foreign speculators manipulating and destroying the dollar. It was the private Federal Reserve that was destroying the dollar's value. And the Fed did so with the full agreement and cooperation of the government, ignoring the Bretton Woods agreement to tie the dollar to gold. Before World War II ended, Western nations had agreed at Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, to tie their currencies to the U.S. dollar, which would in turn be tied to gold. At the time, the U.S. was economically dominant and had over 50% of the world's gold. But the Federal Reserve ignored the link to gold and had been printing more currency than the U.S. had gold to back for years. The fiat dollars were being used to finance the warfare welfare state of Vietnam and Great Society Socialism. Five years before Nixon declared Bretton Woods dead, the disparity of paper to gold had grown to the point of foreign banks holding $14 billion in paper money from the Federal Reserve, while the U.S. only had $3 billion worth of gold to cover it. Your dollar will be worth just as much tomorrow as it is today. One month before the Nixon shock, Henry Kissinger secretly went to China. 41 years later, we see the fruit of that opening. Multinational corporations joining with communist lords to use the Chinese people as slave labor. Slave wages are just one of many components of China's low cost of production known as the China price. The China price also includes copyright violations, disregard for the health of workers or the environment, and an undervalued currency. Let me lay to rest the bugaboo 
of what is called devaluation. If you want to buy a foreign car or take a trip abroad, market conditions may cause your dollar to buy slightly less. But if you are among the overwhelming majority of Americans who buy American-made products in America... Well, the overwhelming majority of Americans don't buy American-made products, do they? Most of our products are now made in China, thanks to Kissinger and his Bilderberg buddies. So for too long, the United States has entered into trade deals on the promise of economic bounty, only to see workers impoverished. Industries disappear. And the dollar of 2015 isn't worth what the dollar of 1971 was. In fact, it takes six 2015 dollars to buy what one dollar could buy in 1971. In other words, the dollar has lost 83% of its value since Nixon, quote-unquote, protected it from speculators. Your dollar will be worth just as much tomorrow as it is today. Now these same globalist politicians and multinational corporations who've robbed us with the China price for the last 41 years are ready to unleash something else they've been working on in secret, the Trans-Pacific Transatlantic Partnerships. It is a breathtaking event. Uh, it says it's designed to promote the international movement of people, services, and products. Basically the same language used to start the European Union. These trade treaties will not only accelerate the concentration of global wealth, but will give us global governance. And the China trade imbalance they began creating 41 years ago is being used to justify TPP and TTIP just as Nixon lied when he said he was protecting Americans from speculators. These trade treaties are just a head fake. They won't help us to compete with the China price. And as Senator Sessions has pointed out, after the treaty passes, China can be added to the Transnational Governance Committee without approval from member nations. They're simply lying. I welcome this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president's a crook. Well, now you know he was a crook. And by hook or by crook, they're destroying Western economies, cultures, and sovereignty so that they can consolidate us all into a global corporate governance. For InfoWars Nightly News, I'm David Knight. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations, a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. It is a big idea a new world order, a world in which there is the very real prospect of a new world order. After 1989, President Bush kept said, and it's a phrase that I often use myself, that we needed a new world order. There is a chance for the President of the United States to use this disaster to carry out what his father, a phrase his father used, I think only once and hasn't been used since, and that is a new world order. So that the problem of the Bush presidency will be the emergence of a new international order. Within the next four years, we will see the emergence of a new international the order. The beginning of a new international order. The pieces are in flux. Soon they will settle again. Before they do, let us reorder this world around us. I think it's past will be to develop an overall strategy for America in this period when really a new world order can be created. It's a great opportunity. It isn't just a crisis. It's about the future of Europe and a new world order. There's a need for a new world order, but it has different characteristics in different parts of the, of the world. But today, with Asia already outproducing Europe, India and China are clearly becoming part of our new order. We are now facing a common challenge. And the challenge is how to build a world order for the first time in history on a global basis. 
So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, a new world is emerging. It is a new world order with significantly different and radically new challenges. The affirmative task we have now is, uh, is to actually um, uh, create uh, uh, a new world order. Good evening, everybody. President Obama and British Prime Minister Gordon today calling for a new world order to tackle our global economic crisis. And the president outlined his vision of a new world order in which the U.S. would participate fully. We've got to give them a stake in creating the kind of uh, a world order that I think all of us would like to see. So I see a world order in the future with a multipolar world order. I think the new world order is emerging and with it the foundations of a new and progressive era of international cooperation. But in a globalized economy, we are going to have to take global responsibilities and there going to, is going to have to be some semblance of global governance. Never before has a new world order had to be assembled from so many different perceptions or on so global a scale. Nor has any previous order had to combine the attributes of the historic balance of power system with global democratic opinion.